Donald Rowe, Chairperson of the Enforcement Committee of the Medical Board of California, and this is February 2nd, 2012. I'd like to call the Enforcement Committee meeting to order. Um, may I have the roll call, please? Dr. Levine. Here. Dr. Lowe. Here. Ms. Shipsky. Not present. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, Renee Threadwell, who is Chief of Enforcement. Okay. Um, so first, I'd like to uh, get a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. All those, uh, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. All right, do we have any public comment that's not on the agenda? Okay, no public comment, we'll move on. Okay, um, so the next uh, item on the agenda is um, the enforcement subcommittee update and I'm gonna give that uh, update. So on January 3rd, 2012, we had a meeting at, with the uh, medical board members of the enforcement subcommittee to discuss how to reconcile the data between the medical board and the health quality enforcement section of the Attorney General's office. So basically, and historically, every time we have a meeting, we've had these major differences, and they always look worse than they really are because the two systems report it differently and they collect their data differently. So we thought we would try to solve that problem once and for all, so we set up this meeting. I think it was very productive, and it led to a very important meeting uh, that happened on January 9th. So on January 9th, we had a second meeting, and this meeting included not only the people from the Medical Board of California, but we were fortunate to have uh, Mr. Carlos Ramirez and uh, Ms. Gloria Castro uh, from the Attorney General's office. And at that meeting, it was decided that on a monthly basis, we're gonna have an HQES supervisory staff and the Medical Board of California supervisory staff meet to reconcile the prior month's statistics. So Ms. Castro and Mr. Ramirez agreed to provide monthly reports from their case management system, and Ms. Sweet said that the Medical Board of California staff would provide their spe <coughs> specific case activity reporting forms to the HQES. After each district office and the Attorney General's office reconcile their data, one report will be made to the board members. So hopefully this will solve the problem. So a meeting took place on January 18th between the medical board staff and the HQES uh, to facilitate the implementation of this new procedure. So Mr. Ramirez explained that he has provided data to the medical board but the difficulty is this Ms. Whit Whitney could not use the data in the format that it was provided in. So Mr. Ramirez explained that the difficulty that are being experienced in getting these reports that CMS generates to meet the needs of the uh, Medical Board of California. So CMS is the entity within the Department of Justice responsible for the preparation of the reports reflecting their statistical data. And currently they're trying to program a report that will attach the attorney's billings to a particular case. And this data is important to the medical board. So Ms. Ramirez, Mr. Ramirez and Ms. Castro met with the DOJ CMS staff on January 13th in an effort to resolve these issues. On January 23rd, the Medical Board of California also met with the uh, Department of Justice CMS staff with Mr. Ramirez and Ms. Castro and made requests for specific reports to be programmed to meet the board's needs. So in discussing the needs to incorporate the median as well as the mean data in the statistical data to account for the outliers, I suggested that uh, the outlying cases receive an independent review to understand the causes for inaction and remedy them if possible in a more timely fashion. So Ms. Castro stated that the HQES needs the ability to hold cases in abeyance during the pendency of criminal prosecution and that the Deputy Attorney General needs to be involved in the vertical enforcement process once a criminal case is concluded. The Medical Board of California already has the ability to hold cases in abeyance without furthering aging 
age accumulating on the case. Uh, the Medical Board of California is also researching the issue that the vertical enforcement is not being used on cases where a criminal conviction was already obtained. Ms. Castro also reported that the Los Angeles office of HQS are under the orders to not slow down the investigative process, particularly with the scheduling of interviews and the review of expert packages. So in conclusion, in addition to the exchange of documents already described, Ms. Castro stated that she would provide the mid-December report of unfiled cases as well as filed cases to remain open without a notice of defense file. These reports will be provided on a monthly basis. Ms. Whitney said that the Medical Board of California will forward a report of cases over 60 days that are not filed. So both agencies agreed to provide reports that may be of value to assist with reconciling the data and for sharing information. So all in all, I think that we've made tremendous progress. The meetings have been all very productive, and I think we're all on the same page. In essence, what we want to do is to improve our enforcement process, to shorten the enforcement time, uh, and to better serve uh, the California public. So are there any uh, comments from the people up here? Public comment? Okay, good. Being that there's no comment, we'll move on to the next item. So this is uh, <coughs> the meat of today's uh, meeting, and we have an update on the expert reviewer training, and this is going to be provided by Ms. Laura Sweet. Uh, the reason that we're having this on the agenda is that we believe that improving the um, training of the reviewers will greatly enhance our, our ability to enforce better and to provide better data to the uh, Attorney General's office. So, Ms. Sweet. the PowerPoint. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, pardon. <laughs> it's right there at the bottom. But before, I don't need that for a second. So good afternoon. I, I wanted to give you all an update on the progress of the expert reviewer training project. Um, I'm going to start off with some of the challenges that we've faced um, because of the high number of supervisor vacancies and the need to cover those positions. This project has taken um, a little bit longer than I would have liked, but the good news is that it's almost finished and we should be ready for our first session in April, and that's April of this year. We also ran into a little bit of a technical challenge that turned out to be a good thing for us. The, uh, the folks at UC Davis used the interactive PowerPoint system to facilitate audience participation and student participation, which is very beneficial, especially to, um, to determine who's enjoying some good slumber and who is actually participating and taking in the training. So um, the, it, during this um, development of our project, they switched their, um, their transmitting devices from the clicker to the actual use of a laptop computer or an iPhone and I was a little bit concerned that our experts wouldn't all be in possession of those types of devices. So we were able to acquire our own transmitting devices, which is gonna be really good for us because we can take our show on the road and not have to rely on other entities' equipment, and we can also use it for other purposes. So what, what I wanted to show you now is just take you through the lesson plan, the outline of the training that is being thus far proposed. Um, this is a draft, so it still has um, it still has wiggle room and opportunity for modification. Oh. Um, if you could go to number one, the very first page. Actually, that's not the PowerPoint. Yeah, that's okay. But the um, committee members, you, you do have a copy of the outline. Okay, I'll just go ahead. Am I, can I go do it? You can do whatever oh, you want. Okay.
So the first hour of the training, and, and the training is actually going to be approximately seven hours. Um, it may seem like a long time, but I think for the importance of the work that our experts are doing, it's time very well invested. So the first hour will be basically introductory types of information. I really want to stress to the expert how critical they are to the mission of the Medical Board of California and the consequences of both good and poor opinions. Um, as with any training, we want to discuss what the goals of the training are. Um, immunity is always a big concern of experts, so I want to be able to spend some, some time on that. And then um, we always like to tell the, uh, explain to the experts who they're going to be interacting with. So the members of the enforcement team, um, we want to discuss what happens prior to the expert actually receiving the case and what the expert should expect from us. And if they don't get what they need in order to make a good opinion, then they need to more or less demand it. And then we we'll want to spend some time on the types of cases that an expert can expect to review. And it's really interesting because the type of case, each type of case has its own unique legal concerns and concerns as to what the expert needs to address. So we'll spend some time going over that. If you could turn to the next slide, please. Then we're going to um, spend a, more time on quality of care definitions and legal descriptions. One of the struggles experts report to us is distinguishing between a simple departure from the standard of care and an extreme departure from the standard of care. So we've got um, we've developed a whole bunch of scenarios for experts to you know, more or less vote on what they think and then hopefully we'll be able to so solicit some discussion that solidifies um, the expert's understanding of th those uh, particular terminologies. And then of course, um, drug, drug violation cases, overprescribing cases, and tractable pain cases have their own unique laws. So we'll be some, spending some um, additional time on that. And then we'll be also discussing sexual misconduct cases. And the most important point we want to convey there is that the judge is the assessor of the credibility. Not, that's not the expert's job. So during the second hour, we're going to be discussing the actual written opinion itself and what the format, the exact format that we absolutely need to see. Armando, if you could go to the next, next screen, thank you. Can, can we uh, ask questions? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, uh, that's a big agenda for one hour. <laughs> we're going to visit again in another part, part of the... Okay. I, okay, I just and that's that's great because we can I can modify this too, I, um, and you could probably in one hour throw up PowerPoint slides that contain the elements of this. I'm just wondering where there's time and whether there's time for questions mm -hmm. um, of the folks that are in the training. So okay, that that's great can, feedback. Maybe we can make an eighth hour too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, but no, but that's excellent. That's great feedback. And, and, and one other question is, are you planning to use as educational materials examples of where uh, uh, the expert reviewer and whether uh, uh, not following the intent yes. of the expert reviewer uh, role, mm -hmm. if you will, or mm -hmm. Uh, a difference between what the expert reviewers submitted and then testified um, got in the way of the right thing happening, okay. if you will. Are you planning to? to We're going to do that, and, and that's a great idea to actually take the case and the original opinion. We, we do have some actual examples of testimony where we're going to show where the testimony fell apart, and it's going to translate to the issue of, of standard of care and right. departures and stuff like that. But I like your idea of actually having that <coughs> opinion be potentially incorporated, so that's, that's, that's a good idea. Okay, so the, um, so we're going to be talking about, I mean, the item number 11 looks petty about aesthetics, but um, actually, this is, this is an important topic also. Sometimes we'll receive opinions, believe it or not, that are handwritten. Um, the typeset looks kind of funky. Uh, there's no signature, no date. And how that can translate to 
um, a lack of credibility, you know, the defense will make an issue of that and try to attach a lack of credibility just because of these types of petty things. So we'll be focusing on that as well. Hours three and four is something new. We have not spent much time in previous expert trainings dealing with the issue of testifying. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to touch on this. This actually could probably be an eight hour course in and of itself, which is something, you know, we may want to contemplate for the future. But we're going to have an administrative law judge who's going to do a, a presentation in this particular subject matter. And then we, um, I found a video of testimony that turned out very well, so I want to be able to show what, what excellent testimony looks like. And then one of the soup dags down south had called about a case where he was very disappointed um, about what happened with the expert's testimony, and I think that was largely due to the lack of expert, or excuse me, lack of experience, because the expert may not have known what to expect or had not testified before. So um, in order to preserve identities and change, you know, identifying facts, we actually um, made a new script of the, the um, informational points of that testimony, and your own medical board staff is in the process of acting that out. So it'll actually be, we're using the OAH's courtroom, and we're going to have a video of that as well to show the consequences of, you know, falling into some of a, a savvy defense attorney's traps. So, um, and then, so I'm excited about that because we haven't done that before. Um, we're going to spend an hour talking about the other rules our experts um, undertake for us, conducting physical examinations, mental examinations, um, and sitting on oral competency panels, and some of the trials and tribulations attached to those functions. And then hour six and seven, um, I've ac uh, been able to actually put together an, an expert package itself, a small one, and so that's going to be handed out. And of course, we don't really have a mechanism in place for people to write their own opinion, but I'm hoping through the interactive PowerPoint process that I can have like samples of w you know what's wrong with this one, what, you know which one is correct, which one's not correct, and so um, so that there's more actual participation rather than just constant lecture. So we're very, very close. I'm very excited. Uh, we're basically down to scheduling the dates, coordinating the schedules of the presenters, and sending out invitations. And Dr. Lowe has been just um, instrumental in this process. I want to thank him for all of his support. And uh, this has been a long undertaking, but I'm excited because we're almost ready to launch it. That concludes my report. Yeah, I'd like to thank you. Uh Ms. Sweet for her untiring efforts uh, directed to this. So just again, the purpose of trying to get this educational program underway for the experts is that once we have better training of our experts, we believe that we're going to be have higher quality and improved efficiency. Many physicians, if not all, feel honored when they're asked to be an expert and everybody wants to do it but we don't want anybody to do it. We want people that are highly qualified to do it who understand their role as an expert. And as an expert, it's not to find a decision in favor of the medical board. It's to give us meaningful, objective input. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not asking them to help make a case for us. We're asking them for the objective input exactly. because it's that kind of data that we have to turn over to the AG's office and it's that data that we have to move forward on. So it's extremely important. So it's not going to be easy to get our experts to go to this meeting. So we want to do a really good program. And to do a really good program and to be able to keep their attention for seven or eight hours is going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So we hope to be able to make it exciting enough that they'll stay awake. We'll make it interactive so they'll have to participate. We plan to use as many case examples as we can, and we're going to draw from the best experts that we have in each of these areas to make those presentations. So everybody will be charged to make their presentation the most interesting, exciting, because we want to keep everybody engaged. So I'm excited about this, and I think that there's a lack of understanding on the experts' part, despite the fact that enforcement has put together a lot of resources on DVD for their training. Mm -hmm. It's just that even though you make the resources available and you ask them to do it, 
I'm not convinced that they actually do it. So we're going to try to make this expert training required uh, for, for people that we use. So I think it's, it's clearly an exciting thing and it's something that I think will go a very long ways and put the whole process in perspective for the experts mm -hmm. so they'll better understand their role. And in terms of their own report, we can give them a detailed format now that they have to follow for the report. So it won't be scribbled in handwriting and so forth and so on. Right, right. One, two things I forgot to mention. One is that during this um, testimony of the poor expert who didn't have such a good day, the defense really capitalized on the fact that the medical board did not provide training. He wanted to go down a whole line of questioning about what did your tr training consist of. So I'm very proud of the fact that we'll, we'll have a good body of work. And then the second thing I wanted to mention is that all the board members are welcome to attend this training if they wish. Um, and actually there's a third thing to work out the kinks because I do want to make sure that it's very professionally presented. We're probably going to request our staff our investigative staff to attend a trial run of the training too. So hopefully that will be beneficial also. Yes. How many times do you think you'll offer this a year? That's a great question. You have a lot of expert. Well, we, we plan to do it geographically. We're going to do it in Northern California and then in Southern California and then very Southern California. We're not sure where Southern is going to start and Northern is going to end, but it's going to be in Sacramento for sure, in Los Angeles and probably San Diego. We're trying to figure out whether or not Central Valley can support this program. You know, it's a facilities problem. Yeah. And then I would think as we get maybe 50 people signed up that we could put a training on. I think it, it would be worth, yeah. Okay. I think it'll be very instructional, even for our own board members, so that everybody can truly understand the process from the time something comes in as a complaint until we actually have some proceedings. And, uh, you know, this is going to be invaluable. Okay. Great. Um, great. Ad additional comments, Kurt? Comments? Okay. Is there any public comment? Okay, being that there's no further comment, we'll move on to the final agenda, my agenda item, and that is uh, agenda items for the May 3rd and 4th meeting in Los Angeles. In addition to the update on the expert reviewer, are there any additional items to be considered? I think we'll probably have an update of the report of this ongoing process and the meetings uh, with the uh, AG's office on uh, the timelines and the data collection and so forth, so we'll have that. We'll have an update on this expert reviewer program, and by then we should have done one of these programs and we'll have feedback from that. So are there any other uh, items? I think by next meeting we'll have some additional board members since we've had two new appointees. And so we thank the governor for that. Okay, so um, being that there's no further co uh, com public comment, uh, and there's no other business, I guess the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.